Welcome to Clearing Your Path to Health with Caroline on this, the 1st of June, 2020. So first of all, I want to say a massive thank you to my producer, Scott Weaver, and also to everyone, all the really lovely people who commented last last time and sent questions and congratulated me on my first show two weeks ago. So that was really kind of you and it really helped me. So today we are going to look at the rather large subject of fear. And the irony is that as I'm sitting here today, for some reason, I'm feeling a little bit nervous. <laughs> so my tendency when I'm nervous is to talk really, really fast. So I'm really trying to rein that in a little bit. But anyway, let's get right into it. So the first thing I thought would be a really good idea to do is look at what actually happens to your body when you get frightened. So the reason that fear exists is to protect us. So when you're in fear, if you're standing in front of a tiger that's just about to attack you or a car's coming at you way too fast or a thousand other reasons why you might be frightened, your brain sets off this elaborate and very coordinated response even when there's no threat. What I mean by that is it could be a tiger immediately in front of you, which is obviously very terrifying. But you could be thinking about a tiger in front of you in your imagination. And that to the body is exactly the same as if there really was a tiger in front of you. So the, res the response is released in seconds. So it's a really fast response. It's part of your autonom autonomic nervous system. And this is a system that manages reflexes like breathing, your heart beating, digestion, things like that. So it's the system that without anything from you, no conscious involvement whatsoever, keeps your body going. So fear kicks in your fight or flight response into overdrive. So what happens is your adrenal glands secrete, secrete adrenaline, blood flow decrease, decreases to your brain's frontal lobe, which is sadly where you uh, think logically and do all your planning so in a moment of fight or flight you lose that capacity to think for yourself and uh, your amygdala takes over which is the part of the brain which is much more about animal instinct not not really logically looking at a situation and analyzing all the different points but literally instinct kicks in um, your heart rate and your blood pressure increase and that's just as a way for your body to be able to run faster if you need to run um, and your muscles tense up for the same reason to be able to allow you to run faster your pupils dilate so that you can see the threat more clearly and blood flows are away away from your extremities which means your hands get really cold and clammy uh, you you can get feeling a bit hot and sweaty elsewhere but anything that your body deems not necessary in order to fight this tiger or illusory tiger um, your body sort of shuts down other systems so for example digestion is not a system that's necessary whilst you're running for your life from this tiger so things like that get shut down or slowed down so once again your body doesn't know the difference between a threat or a real threat and here i have to say you know i'm not one of those people that enjoys horror films i do not <laughs> I don't understand people that like to get fearful, but there are a vast number of the population because they keep producing these movies. So some people thrive on that adrenaline rush, that feeling really scared, and they love it. I'm not one of those, but that's OK. No judgment there at all. So to your fear response, this thing that's happening to you literally without your um, conscious involvement, as it were, you are always in the woods running away from a predator. So it's just trying to keep you alive. It's not happening for any other reason. So, OK, so now we know what happens when we get into fear. So I want to look a little bit into why um, there are things in our lives and other lifetimes which affect this lifetime, which can really greatly affect how frightened we are. 
So the first one I want to look at is past lives. And some people say that we live all of our lives at the same time. Some people don't believe in past lives. But my belief is that they exist because they come up so very often in my in my sessions with my clients. Um, so, for example, if I'm looking at someone who is so anxious that they can't leave their room or, um, you know, has real fear and a past life comes up, often to me it explains the reason, you know, the underlying reason why they've got this anxiety. So in past lives to do with fear and anxiety, what I will be looking at often is lives where they've lost all their family or... Um, yeah been pushed off a cliff or you know like really really frightening events and what happens is we bring with us all the um, large emotional issues that we haven't resolved yet so for example if I'm just about to be eaten by a tiger in real life and this is the end of my life I will be terrified to the point that I'm dead. So there isn't any room there for me to process that fear. So as that soul moves on to the next life and the next life, my belief is we bring those things with us until such time as we can process them. So sometimes you will be literally the most calm, um, unfearful person until your 21st birthday let's just pick a date and sometimes when I look into clients who suddenly de developed really really debilitating fear I'm looking back at another lifetime where on their 21st birthday for example they had a, a life-threatening experience or they lost their life or or something like that so it has um, come into ex existence in this lifetime when it happened in the last lifetime. Now, I really genuinely love dealing with past lives. And it really often is if you've got a massive fear that you cannot find the root cause for or it doesn't make any sense to you or it's not in your family line, I would suggest that possibly you're dealing with something that happened in a totally different lifetime. OK, so that's the first one. The second one, we are going to look at what happens to you in your fetal life. So you're in mum's tum for, you know, between seven to nine months, depending on how that goes for you. And what I always say is for women, it, it can be really challenging, especially if it's your first pregnancy, because life still continues to happen whilst you're growing this child in yourself. And honestly, I think, you know, giving birth to a child is probably one of the most amazing, wondrous things that a human being can do. But all mums are human. So let's take an example where, you know, for example, the mother with the unborn child in her belly loses her father, for example. It's just an example. But, you know, that that will bring into the, the, the life of the mother deep, deep grief, possibly great fear. You know, I relied on my dad a lot. I wonder how I'm going to get through with this new child, this life that I'm bearing. Um, and all of that sort of washes over the fetus. And unfortunately, there's not much that can be done <laughs> about this. It's just what happens. So very often, again, in my sessions, when I'm going back into the fetal life, I'll be like, you know, an example might be, oh, I'm at seven months and gosh, yes, mum's really angry, but there's a lot of fear with that. And I'm feeling you picking up a belief system. I'm not safe or it's not going to be safe for me out there or something along those lines. And, you know, um, yeah, so these things can happen and we can pick up and misinterpret often is the case we can misinterpret what's going on in the outside world because I imagine for the unborn baby it's warm it's comfortable it's safe I'm right next to my mum's heartbeat I feel really calm but something happens to her that really upsets her or you know one of the the really common things that happens to women especially in their first pregnancy you know let's say I don't know two months before oh my gosh what am I doing I'm never going to be able to do it I'm going to be a dreadful mum sadly this is the way women think but again this is the sort of thing that the baby picks up on and it's like oh I'm not going to be safe or I'm not going to be looked after properly or now this episode for the mother might go on for half an hour and then the partner might be saying oh no don't be silly we'll do it together and it'll be fine but to the baby it's already sort of taken on as a belief system so I do a lot of work going back into the fetal life. So that's another place where we can pick up fears, um, you know, and they can really impact our lives. OK, so the next one is inherited 
emotions and sp- particularly fear we're talking about today. Uh, let me pick an example from my life. My father was terrified, and I mean terrified of heights. I am equally <laughs> absolutely petrified I can't even watch on TV as someone goes towards the edge I'm so so terrified my personality is a bit different to most and I don't know if this is healthy or not but I made myself jump out of an airplane because I wanted to prove to myself that I wasn't you know in emblazoned to my um fear of heights it didn't make any difference I'm still really really scared of heights but at least I jumped out of the plane anyway So sometimes what happens um, when we're looking at things like fear is if I have a client with me and we're looking at a really strong fear, I'll see, for example, four women behind the client who are standing to the left hand side. So I'll know it's the mother's side. And what is being expressed in the client comes from client, mother, grandmother, great grandmother. So four generations back is great grandmother. So something really traumatic happened in the great grandmother's life and she wasn't able to process it for whatever reason. Uh, Maybe she lost a child or, you know, there's all sorts of things can, can go on and there was wars and yeah, many, many traumatic, scary things. So great grandmother didn't process it. She passed it on to grandmother who didn't consciously know that she was carrying it and didn't display any symptoms of having that great fear to mum and mum was really frightened all her life but not specifically about the thing that great grandmother was frightened about and then we have my client in front of me who is displaying a really strong fear but we can't work out why when we go back into the great grandmother I hope I've said that right I get those very mixed up but when we go back into the grandmother and we discover what the problem is Usually we can heal what's going on in the person in front of me because um, it's been passed down the generations and, you know, a little bit of it, of it has been processed here, a little bit here, but we can really lift that off. So I love working with things like that. And the great thing about the healing work that I do is then all the generations, whether they're living or not, receive a healing on that particular aspect. So that feels really empowering but also if I'm a a slightly overbearing parent or I have massive fears myself or there's one particular area I'm terrified of dogs for example because I got bitten as a child or or whatever it is it is so easy for me to pass that on to my child by my behavior without you know saying you should be scared of dogs but if a child watches mum being really really or dad it doesn't have to be mum but all dad um behaving really really frightened around Um, an animal for example or a behavior or something like that it's really easy for the kid to think oh I have to be really careful of that particular thing so really taking on you know mum or dad's fears because they haven't dealt with them in any way so and then we have the aspect of childhood which if for example you are growing up in a house that's really fearful um Let's say you live in a war-torn area. I really hope people listening are not don't have that. But if you do, yes, it's a very frightening um, arena to grow up in. Or if you live in a house where one of the parents is really controlling and the other one's really frightened. Or let's take a, you know, an example where maybe one of your siblings died of a family disease and the parents are then really really frightened for the children that are remaining in case they get it too so there's a hundred thousand different ways that parents can be worried about their children and show fear to their children um so if i'm growing up in a really fearful environment um a good way of saying this i suppose is if you have a neural pathway within your brain and you think the same thought over and over and over again let's imagine it's I don't feel safe if my house is really changeable children like uh, routine they like boundaries they like to know what's going on it makes them feel safe within their environment if it's one day everybody's happy and jolly and the next day there's violence or they're shouting or you know whatever that for a child is really hard to fathom So what I mean is if the neural pathway gets laid down over and over again, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe, over years, it's not that the child takes on 
the particular fears and worries of the parents. But what it does do is it has a really well-worn pathway which makes it incredibly sensitive to anything that's frightening. So when we are in a situation, we have, I can understand why the brain does this to us, but we have this, um, yeah, what happens is immediately I will take a snapshot of a situation when it gets to feel a bit uncomfortable. Now, it might be I'm having an argument with my partner, I could be feeling rejected, uh, whatever. And, that, and my brain takes a snapshot of the um, situation and it immediately marks it as safe or as a threat. If it's a threat, quite a lot of my brain gets switched off because the brain doesn't want me to spend time analysing and working things out and spending time, etc. It wants me to get out of the situation or... Um, you know, or, or manage my own safety. What tends to happen when the rest of the brain is switched off, including the logical brain, is I come out with, if I'm feeling threatened, I come out with anger, blame, criticism. I can come out with overwhelm or nervousness or tears or depression. And if I look at the situation afterwards with a clear mind, I can see, oh, I felt like I wasn't being listened to, which for me is a threat. Or I felt... Um, like I wasn't being valued, which to me seems like a threat. And what I did was I reacted with anger and aggression and, and whatever. So take this young man that I was just talking about, this child who has been brought up in a household that doesn't feel safe. He's got this really furrowed root in his brain, a neural pathway that is deep and um, well used. And he will react over the top, I would imagine, uh, under many circumstances, which perhaps you and I wouldn't think of as unsafe, he will think almost everything is unsafe because essentially inside he doesn't feel safe. So I hope I'm making that clear. It can, if you are brought up in a frightening environment and frightening for me might be not frightening for you. And, uh, you know, I there's totally no judgment here. But if you don't have self-confidence and validation and love and respect when you're growing up and not most you know there's a lot of people that don't then it can lead to you being super super sensitive to everything and anyone later in life and it's not until we work out what the problem is and why you keep overreacting in situations that we can you know and then work on those fears and work to help you find new pathways which are I am safe I am happy etc so yeah that really is something that again comes up a, um, a lot for me in my sessions okay so another um, thing that can provoke excess fear in later life I wrote down the word loss so I've lost my guinea pig, my dog, my grandma, a sibling, you know, something important to me as a child has chosen to leave me. And I think in a child's mind, it's very difficult to understand that it was that person's time to leave or that the dog had come to the end of its life. Children tend to take those sorts of things personally. And often when I'm working with clients to um, help them with massive fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, with separation anxiety, it, it goes back to a, I'm going to use the word profound loss, because to that child, that rabbit or the, you know, the guinea pig or moving cities and leaving behind my best, best friend can induce, you know, very strong feelings of fear and, you know, some of the results of that can be really impossible to make good relationships because I, I'm always convinced that you're going to leave me. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of issues there. Maybe I will do one of my group sessions on fear of abandonment. That's that's come up. I think that's a really big one for some people. And then one of the last ones is the fear that I project onto other people. So. I have been on a very long journey of self-discovery, I suppose the word is, and self-healing. And um, what I found was, so it was very critical in my, when I was growing up. And so I criticised everybody. I had the most ridiculously high standards for everybody, which everybody failed to meet 
because they were too high. I had those same standards for myself, so I was always disappointing myself. And what I was told was when we're critical of others, which I was all the time, uh, because someone had been really, really critical of me, and I'm judging and I'm blaming and all of those beautiful things, um, when I'm doing it unto others, as it were, then I'm really, really unkind to myself. And I didn't believe this for one second, but I promise as I learned not to judge others, so literally if I saw a woman and my immediate thought was her hair is really scruffy or something ridiculous like that, I'm really sorry to admit that, but that's the truth for me. I would walk down the street always judging everyone else because I was really judging myself. But anyway, so if I said to myself, oh, that woman's hair is scruffy, Okay, I've just caught myself doing it, but I bet she's got loads of really good friends and I bet she's a really, really kind person. And I would make myself say three really nice things about her. And it wasn't easy. And gradually, 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 I stopped judging others. I can't say I'm perfect. No, no, no. But I stopped judging others and I learned like I slowly felt that I was being a lot, lot kinder to myself. So some of our projected fears onto others are fears that we experience ourselves. So as we learn to um, draw back that fear, that judgment, that blame, that criticism, we can learn that perhaps I am safe or that perhaps I am a better person than I thought I was. And then we have the, um, the, the other word for fear, which is phobia. And I read in a lot of the medical, um, you know, online and things like that. I read a lot of people who say that there is no explanation for the fear from a phobia. And I don't agree with that because very often people are frightened of spiders because they saw a really big one when they were little and they got really scared and they ran away. Or they are really frightened of confined spaces because they once got locked in under the stairs by mistake by friends when they were playing hide and seek or but anyway, some of the most common phobias are confined spaces, dentists. I feel so sorry for dentists. Honestly, they do a great job. But yeah, lots of people are frightened of dentists. Dogs, flying, heights, me and needles, me. Pregnancy, that one surprised me. Um, sickness, spiders, insects, obviously water and lack of safety. Those are some of the most common um, phobias. But if we're looking at some of the biggest fears, I've been watching quite a few videos on this. It's very interesting. They all come up with basically the same four or five. My fear is being laughed at. My fear is being ignored. I'm frightened of getting it wrong. I'm frightened of being rejected. I'm frightened of being alone. Or I'm frightened of not being noticed. So... That's what I wanted to talk about with fear. I'm sure I've missed out many, many points. What we're going to do after the break is if you would like to go to the One Two Radio uh, Facebook page and put in any fear related questions that you have, I'm going to tune into them and see if I can't help you find out where they came from or what, what you're carrying and why you've got it. Now, the point of doing these shows is not to make you feel worse about your fear or your abandonment or whatever it is. It's to try and find ways to help you to overcome. So please do post in the Facebook group and um, I'll certainly be looking that um, after the, you know, after the break. So that will be exciting. I love doing that sort of thing. But also, I just wanted to have a quick word about what's going on in you know, the world today. We are in a really strange time. There's so much fear on the news, in the papers, on, on you know, online um, platforms as well. And some of what I'm trying to help my clients find out is that when things are really confusing out there and frightening and, you know, you just don't know what to do, this is a, such an important time to go within and find out what's true for you. Trust your own intuition and um, when very little makes sense out there, it's really important that you know what your truth is and how you um, are able to 
follow your intuition that comes from within because it's your soul guiding you regardless of what other people say or think of you so i think this is a very important time for humanity to step up and to you know get rid of the things that we we are carrying like old fears and anger and grief and all those wonderful things and i really um yeah i'm looking forward to seeing what the questions are that come the other side of the break so um just a quick note then i have been doing some group sessions so you can find these on my email based services um on one to listen so the ones that i've done which will be um which are available to you so fear of the unknown so a group session on fear of change feeling overwhelmed feeling stuck and lack of self-love was the one I did on Friday. So a few of the ones that are coming up are health anxiety. That's a big one for my family. Lack of trust in self, poverty consciousness, fear of abandonment. Oh, I'd already put it down. There we are. And letting go. So if those are of interest to you, just um, hop on over to my email based services on when to listen. And, um, yeah, if you have any questions at all, just drop me a, a message on Facebook or get in touch with me by, by, via one to listen. So I'll just say this in case I forget it at the end of the show. The next show in two weeks time, which is the 15th of June, is going to be called Why Do We Get Sick? So I think that's a really huge topic and um, I hope to be able to offer you some really good avenues to look at if you are interested in getting well, which I'm assuming you are if you're listening to the show. So I'm going to leave it there. We're going to go to the break. And when we come back, I'm going to check in the Facebook group and answer some of your questions. So thank you for listening and I'll see you after the break. so happy that you have found one two radio if you'd like to join us in the chat room just head over to one two radio.com click on the chat button and just like that you'll be redirected into our facebook chat room it's magic
So welcome back, everybody, and thank you for that great question, Mac. Um, Mac has been having sessions with me now for a while. She suffers with a really horrendous disease. I hope you don't mind me saying that, but it causes her enormous pain on many, many levels. And so we've worked really hard on clearing that through. So I just need needed to say that so that I could then read the question. I want to live a pain-free life. Fantastic. And feel like with your help, I'm achieving this. But on some level, I'm afraid to live without my pain. Why am I so scared to let go of my pain for good? I have wholeheartedly decided to be pain-free, but how do I choose with every cell in my body to be pain-free? Such a rocking question. Thank you so much. So... If I tune into my intuition, what I want to say to you is we're talking to the little girl in you who uh, saw how fragile life was, I think, and um, really didn't ever commit to being on this planet. I hope you don't mind me saying that, but that's what I'm getting. So it feels as though illness is almost a way of keeping you here. It feels to me that you are very um, determined to get to a pain-free life. I know that I felt that in your spirit when we are working together. But there's still something about the little girl who, who maybe got some attention. I hate to say this, but often we can um, – we can be really have a vested interest in being ill because maybe that's the only way we're getting attention in our life and maybe that was the only way we got attention as a child. I definitely know I've worked through that one myself. Uh, mother, when we were ill, knew that she had children. So that was really great. But, um, yeah, it messes the child up because, you know, obviously children, it's not fun being ill. And you don't always understand um, the greater scheme of things when you're, you know, in great pain, etc. So I'm not saying that everybody does that. I'm saying there just are a few. But I really feel like for you, the answer to that um what is it that's stopping me from really committing to this? Is that little girl who almost lost her life? And, you know, I'm just going to dive into a little bit of a caveat here. So it's not a caveat, but a side story. And that is my belief is that children until the age of about seven kind of go home a lot. What I mean by that is they go back to spirit. They certainly do it when they're sleeping. But you can see in certain children that they're sort of daydreaming a lot. And it might be that they're, you know, in England, what we say is off with the fairies, but actually they're reconnecting with spirit and they're going home and then they come back into their body and then they go home and they come back into their body. And around about the age of seven, which is a very important age, because that's when we start feeling that, oh, I'm not my mum and dad. And I'm, you know, you go from seven to sort of 11. And that's the next growing age where you're you're becoming separate from your parents. You're moving into your personality. I mean, you already have your personality, but this is where it really develops. And you are kind of individ individualizing, that's such a difficult word for me to say, individualizing. So what I mean by that, by that is you're becoming who you are. Now, then you go through the horrendous thing called uh, puberty, which I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And then you go into adulthood and you go through more and more growing phases. But as a, up until the age of about seven, for some children, it's five, for some children, it's eight. But around about seven, you really move into your body consciously and you are what I call on this planet and rooted. And when something really difficult happens sort of around the age of two or three, children can really choose to be more with, you know, their spirits where they're pain free and it's not so difficult than they can be down here. And I know you had that accident when you were, I think two and a half, three years old, something like that. I can't remember. But I'm wondering if that's why you float off a little bit. And I didn't realize this, but um, Mark has started making these incredible fairy houses. They are outstanding. And she said that I um, 
that I told her in an angel reading to go and, you know, play for the child and make fairy houses. I don't remember saying that, but I'm so thrilled because she's discovered a real talent. And, um, yeah, she's really, really good at it. But I'm wondering if this is the child in you wanting to express itself because as an adult, you're finding it really difficult through your illness. I feel like I'm waffling. I really hope that makes sense. We can definitely work on that in some of the next sessions. But um, if I'm really honest, also, I'm seeing a tortured soul who um, was racked with pain in a life that you were really like you really loved that life it was just such a joy to you I'm going to say I feel as though you were sort of like the village idiot a little bit you were very 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 uh simple and you had something horrifically wrong with your body I'd you know like really twisted arms and things like that I don't know what was wrong with you but you found in that illness more joy than you have I think possibly in any of your other lifetimes. So this uh, child at three is remembering all the attention you got possibly for being ill and how much joy this brought you in that lifetime. I mean, I'm guessing that you've brought it into this lifetime. We're going to have some fun sessions, aren't we? <laughs> but um, I really appreciate you asking that question because Sometimes when I'm frightened to allow the good in, it can be for a reason that you don't believe in yourself or you haven't um, given yourself an, the opportunity to uh, commit to anything. I know that's not true with you, but I'm just saying usually when we're scared to let go of something, it's because we've got a very good reason for keeping it. So I can see that there's another question. Thank you, Terry, for asking a question. So what I'm going to do is leave it there, Mac. If um, I get through Terry's quite quickly, then I might come back because there's a bit more to say on that one. But it was such a good question. Thank you for asking it. So Terry asked, Caroline, I hear a fear of being alone I have, that must be, a fear of being alone late in life. My mum died in 91, my dad in 03, and my husband in 16. I'm so sorry about that. Other thing is I really love being by myself at home. And the bug earwigs, oh, sorry, somebody's just messaged me, sorry. And the bug earwigs, we call them pincher bugs. They terrify me. Okay, I've not heard of those. It's interesting because you say you have a fear of being alone, but I really love being by myself at home. And for you, I'm feeling like there's a big network around you of people that really love you. And it feels as though so you're never really alone. You've got your own space, but you're. You're very loved by your community is what I'm feeling. Um, I think your fear of being alone is actually to do with your mum dying. I feel like perhaps she had a bit of a, a struggle herself uh, being, um, she may not have been alone, but some people can be alone in a really, really good relationship. I feel like she felt a little bit alone towards the end possibly because she was really really sick I don't know but I'm just feeling this feeling of being alone and um yeah I feel like you're it's almost as if you have the fear but it's not uh the most important thing I really feel like um You've discovered yourself in your later life and being at home on your own is really your, your kingdom and you're feeling really happy. So to the bug earwigs, we call them pincher bugs. They terrify me. I'm seeing a picture of a little boy. Aren't little boys glorious? <laughs> I was being sarcastic. So I'm seeing a picture of a boy throwing something like that, either at you or at a little girl. I don't know what yet. So I'm feeling that... When I, you know, you're very short. <laughs> I think you were quite young when this happened. And some, I just feel like somebody threw something like that at you or possibly I'm seeing a different lifetime. But it just feels like the, the real fear comes from them being on you. And yeah, yeah, 
which makes complete sense. So, um, what can the angels tell me about that? So, you're being asked, because it's one of God's creatures, how about you make friends with one if you can? Because very often we're really frightened of things until we know them. And the angels are just showing me you maybe getting one in a thick glass jar or and just having a bit of a chat with it. I'm really frightened of you, but I want to get to know you so that I'm not frightened of you. That's what they're showing me. If that horrifies you, I'm really, really sorry. But um, that could be a very good way of, um, yeah, getting to... Get rid of your phobia. Oh, there's a lovely picture. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I d I'm not, you know, they're not my best friend. But um, if you had it so that it was safe behind glass, I'm just I'm just thinking you need to f reframe your um, relationship with them. Maybe get one and call it Henry or something. I really hope that was helpful, Terry. I don't, um, I, I'm not getting anything else for you. I really don't think you should not be by yourself. I think being by yourself, this this end of your life is, sorry, that sounded awful. But, you know, for the rest of your life just seems like the right thing to do. But it does feel that you have a bit of a fear, which you picked up around the time that your mother passed away. OK, well, I hope that's helpful and I give you that with lots of love. Do we have any other fear questions? If we've run out of fear questions and you want me to answer a question about anything else, then please um, just post your question now. OK, and Mac has sent me. I will read that out. So um, a question on my um messenger here's my other question i can uh i am afraid not to be with my family in my next in the next part of my life oh in my next life sorry why do i fear this so much um i'm going to say that i think for that one i don't think that is a reality i don't think you need to worry about that so that's a really good example so thank you for that of fearing something that may or may not come to pass um and i'm not getting that that's going to be the case for you we have things called soul families and we often incarnate with the same people they may be under different guys so your husband this time might be your daughter next time or you know we we do that but when you're part of a soul family and that soul family the family you have is so solid and and um healthy that i'm i'm really not feeling for you that um you need to worry about that there's lots and lots of things in life that cause us to worry but i do feel that that is something that uh could well be a waste of time it's possible that you've spent lifetimes alone and you're really enjoying the company um that's coming to my mind now you spent some years like in the wilderness as a nomad or something like that um so that might explain why you're you really want to keep hold of the unit that you've got this time i'm genuinely feeling like you will so i hope that's helpful and uh yeah, one of the things we need to not do is worry about things that will not happen. So 90% of what we worry about doesn't actually happen. So we'll do a show on worry. Thank you for that. That's uh, really helpful. OK, so I can see that Lynn has posted a... Um, oh, straight away, I'm getting that one. I have a fear of being ill, becoming ill. I do have to watch my liver enzymes. Any insights on that? Yeah, I immediately saw that you were an alcoholic. Immediately, immediately, immediately. I see you as an old man. Uh, not Well, not that old, but you look really old because you've basically drunk yourself into a stupor. I'm kind of seeing a bit of a cowboy sort of feel to it. So um, you may well have brought with you from that lifetime I'll tune into a bit more, before, you know, once I've said this, but like a weakness in your liver, because I think he died of sclerosis of the liver. Very, very much alcohol induced. Um, so that's really clear for me. Um, his issue. Oh, bless him. He was broken hearted. 
So I don't know if you've suffered from being brokenhearted this lifetime, but he lost his love in a shooting incident in a bar because he was drunk. He may even have killed her. I'm not really sure, but he it feels like he feels very guilty. So I'm going to make that bit up. So he shot her and turned to the drink because he was so unhappy. So I don't know if that in any way mirrors your... Um, mirrors what's going on for you this lifetime have you had your heart broken i definitely feel with your liver okay so let's tune into your liver yeah definitely liver is going to be if you are to have issues i think that's where it would show i'm definitely seeing angry people being drawn to you liver is all about the anger it's a big filtration system it's it's fantastic for you know many many jobs in the body but you can see from the size of it how important it is and it's where we store our anger and process our anger. And um, I'm just feeling that it would be really good for you to sit and write down the sort of 20 people that are closest to you and on a scale of 1 to 10 how angry they are. Anger doesn't always look like shouting. People can be sarcastic and stub their toe a lot and all sorts of ways that anger comes out without shouting and screaming. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be good for you. I'm not saying change your entire life, but I wonder if it would be really good for you to um, try to, um, yeah, not be around people that are really, really angry. I'm feeling into your liver and I don't see any real issue with it. I mean, it's it looks like a typical first world liver, to be honest. You know, it's a bit stressed and it's, you know, working hard, but I can't see that there's any, um, any, you know, any damage done or anything like that. So I'm not feeling frightened for you, but I do feel that um, you are overly influenced, should we say it like that, by people that are angry. Could be that you had an angry parent, I'm not sure, or an angry teacher, but there's something about you and attracting angry people. Um, so, Oh, I see that you put not in this lifetime. No, that's really interesting. Well, I wonder why he, your past life has come through. Maybe because it's just a maybe a warning to look after your liver, which sounds like you're doing. Um, and I think for you, you know, watching the diet. So any the liver really struggles with things like red wine, meat, cheese, anything like that, especially after six o'clock at night, which is, of course, when we like to eat our dinner. So if you can have like a really light evening meal, so salad or, you know, just a nice soup or something like that, I, I'm not telling you how to eat, but I just feel like if you could eat light in the evening and have all the naughty things in the middle of the day that you like, they're not naughty, but, uh, you know, the harder to digest things, because that gives your liver a whole, the whole of the rest of the day to um, digest them. So I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, it's, I'm just need to refresh to see if we've got any more questions. Do give me some feedback if, um, I was way off, but we shall see Terry. Oh, let me see what have you put. Thank you, Karen. You're very welcome. Yeah. For some reason I wanted to call him Henry. I can't really tell you why. So let's do a declaration um to anyone who's listening this is for mac because she's put the specific thing that she wants to choose so how do i choose with every cell in my body to be pain free so the way i do things like that is i just center myself i close my eyes i call in anyone who i work with so with me that's mainly angels and archangels and um ancestors and uh you know anybody like that and i say please hear my declaration i declare this in all directions of time and space my declaration is that i have decided to be pain free this is true for me now, and I expect to see the results soon. 
thank you for listening. Always give thanks for for anything that you do with the archangels, and then just expect it to th- be to be true. You knew you you do need. I'm sorry to um, maybe do that. You know, for ten days or something. But one of the things that you need to do um, really is to um, make sure that with with every cell in your body and you're not looking at your phone and you're not distracted in any way, you just ask the people that you work with. So that, like I said, could be ancestors. It could be, it could be whoever it is, the fairies, the dragons, the unicorns, anyone, anyone you wanted to be, but just make the declaration in all directions of time and space. I think that's really important. So across all lifetimes and so on and so forth, Um, because then you can really, feel it in your body when you're making the declaration if you can't feel it in your body then in my opinion you're probably not centered enough you're probably not feeling the weight of the energy so I would say to you if you don't feel that in you in every cell in your body if you're not sure that if you're just kind of going oh I really want to be pain-free then I'm going to say that you need to get to the point where you're centered, you can go within, you've breathed in and out deeply, and you really are making the statement. So I give you that. I really hope it helps. And I also think that um, that might be good if you get headaches. I make a statement that I'm going to be headache free, or if it's sinus problems or leg problems or um whatever you know i think this is something that you can very comfortably just make a decision now of course oh let me just see and if I, okay let, yes there is a lawsuit against me and my husband yes okay so that would be angry uh that would involve anger i would think this is lynn and did you say henry i knew my cat henry when i was a child okay so maybe there's something about you loved your cat try and learn love that revolting looking bug <laughs> uh thank you jane barbon if that's how you say your name looking forward to your wisdom i really appreciate that okay so uh we're coming up to the end of the show so i just want to say once again do get in touch with me if you want to do some personal healing so you can do that on one two listen i'm under caroline nettle that's my name obviously and um, you can find me on email based services i am in the uk so it's coming up to seven o'clock at night here so sometimes um the only way i can connect with you is if you call in the morning so i do my email based services uh generally remotely and then i send you an mp3 so if that's of interest please go and take a look at my page and we've got the group sessions every friday the one coming up is health anxiety this friday and you can find out about that again on the email email based services and coming up after me, we've got lots more good stuff for you on one to listen this morning. So at 11 a.m., we've got A Course in Miracles with C.A. Brooks. So that's always worth listening to. And at 12 p.m., Kathleen Peterson is going to entertain you with her friends. So next show, like I said, I'm going to be looking at why do we get sick? So it's going to be probably lots of different reasons. And some of them are probably quite similar to what we've done today. But I think if we really look at why we've been sick, that's when we can start, you know, helping people to get well. So that's on the 15th of June. Um, I hope you'll be able to join me again once again at 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. UK time, 7 p.m. Europe. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you so much for all your questions and for getting involved in the chat and everything. Really appreciate that. Um, And I will speak to you again in a couple of weeks on why do we get sick? All right. Back to you, Scott. Thank you.